All right. Hebrews. Most likely feels like from the style of writing. Um, it was probably written by the Apostle Paul. But he does not uh, identify himself as he does in all of his other epistles. Um, so I'm just kind of left, left with a question mark there. Um, we do know that it was written from Italy um, at the end of the uh, letter in chapter 13 it says salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints they of Italy salute you grace be with you all and so that was customary to uh, send the greetings from who you were with and around um, and then in the very pre preceding verse it says know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty with whom if he come shortly I will see you so as with any letter trying to figure out what's our context here where is it written who's writing it who's it written it to um again so we know our writers you know in italy um, we know that he knows timothy um, we know that timothy has been uh most likely in prison um to be set at liberty uh now the freedom um, we know that the writer is seeking to go back, hopefully, to see these people again. So this is not just a general epistle written to all y'all everywhere, but I hope to actually come and, and visit you. Um, and in fact, uh, verse 19 in that same chapter 13 says, But I beseech you rather to do this, asking for prayers, that I may be restored to you the sooner. So obviously he's writing to folks that he knows. Um, and the, you know, the title of the letter is the epistle to the hebrews and so it's a, a message that's um, written to a large concentration of hebrews somewhere most likely not jerusalem um back in chapter uh, eight nine something in acts you'll find it there was an intense persecution um and paul is a part of it at that point he was still you know going by saul and was uh hounding the church so much so that the you know core group that had started there at Jerusalem had to scatter. Um, and they scattered throughout all Judea and Samaria um, and other places. And so your largest concentration of Jews is probably still in that nation of Israel. Um, you know, not every place that um, Paul would visit over his missionary journeys would there even be enough Jews in the town to have a synagogue. You know, so like when he was at Philippi, um, which is you know, one of the first cities in Europe that he visited. Um, you know, he went and found folks who were uh, praying down by the river because they didn't have, have a synagogue. And so if I had to give a guess, I'd say that he's probably writing to the Hebrew Christians who are still in um, Judea and Samaria, um, who he would have known because he's gone through that country and passed through uh, several times. And, um, and so... Anyway, assuming again that the writer is, is Paul. All that being said, um, the book just jumps in rather than a, hey, how you doing? This is me. Here's a two. It starts with God. Right? God. Um, he is the, the acting party. He is the focus um, from the very, very get-go, first word. It starts off with God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, right? So we're dealing with a previous scenario, sundry times, so fun word, um, at various times, in various ways. So God had his different manners and means of delivering his message unto the fathers, and that fathers is shorthand for the natural descendants of Abraham, natural Israel, that they were given messages and the speakers of those to the people was prophets. Now, sometimes he would send an angel to speak to the prophet. Sometimes he'd send a vision to the prophet. Um, but it was at his his call, his call. He was the actor, and he had different times and manners of doing it. Right? It, it varied um, over, you know, that that whole period of time before Christ came. Then you have something shifts. All right, you have. Hath, who's the hath? Well, it's God who, now it's God hath. God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his 
Son, all right? I spoke unto the fathers in the past. Now the audience is us. Then he spoke by prophets, or seers, or, um, uh, yeah, those, those are the two common terms, a prophet or a seer back then. But now he's spoken unto us by his son, all right? So obviously we're talking about Jesus Christ. This is um, some years after Jesus has lived. He died, he resurrected, he's ascended, and it's years after that that Paul was, you know, stopped in his tracks from persecuting the church on the road to Damascus and then became, you know, one of the most zealous advocates um, for Christ. And later in his journey is when he picks up Timothy and Timothy starts traveling around with him. And much, much later, he winds up getting, you know, arrested in uh, Jerusalem, spends time in Samaria, not Samaria, um, Caesarea Philippi um, for you know, a couple of years under arrest and then later is transported to Rome and he's there for at least a couple of years under arrest. And so you've got years and years and years and years that have passed. Um, that's roughly when we're, when we're picking up here. Um, and so he's spoken unto us by his son. All right. So the message had been coming from God through prophets in a lot of different ways. Now the message is coming directly, if you will. By God the Father, um, delivering the message to us by his Son. And then he is going to list off all the ways that the Son, uh, his, his role, um, he, and, and it's, it's teeing up this idea of Christ's superiority um, as a messenger. Um, so one, it starts with, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. So God the Father has appointed, designated, an heir, the one who is entitled to have and possess everything, no exceptions. That's a pretty big role. That's a pretty, I mean, that's, we can't understate that. The heir is the one who, in the end, it's all theirs, right? Well, that's that's the son. He's appointed him to be heir of all things. So that's, that's one. And we're, and we're talking about the superiority of Christ being as, as a messenger. You know, God spoke through the prophets, now he's speaking through his son. He's appointed him heir of all things, one. By whom also he made the worlds. So the by whom, that's the son, he, God the Father, made the worlds. Who is active and there and present um, at creation? Second person of the Trinity, the Word, the Son, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and there was not anything made that was not made, you know, by Him. And so you have the Son who's the heir of all things, they all belong to Him. He was active in making them. By whom God the Father, by Him, the Son, He, God the Father, made the worlds. All right, so you got the Creator, who being the brightness of His glory. Right? So the Son, Jesus, is the illumination of the Father's glory and the express image of his person. You have this, uh, this manifestation, this revealing of the glory and the person of God in Jesus Christ. Right? I mean, again, this is as, as, as high as we uh, hold um, Jesus up. We don't hold him up high enough. We don't recognize high because these, these are very lofty things that no one else um, can claim. So he's the brightness of God the Father's glory. He's the express image of his person and upholdeth all things by the power of his word, right? He's a sustainer. Not only is he created, all things are upheld by the power of his word. You know, when Jesus you know, spoke the storm and it stopped, that was a mealy, mealy, mealy smidgen of power on display. He maintains everything, right? It's by the power of his word that it all um, is upheld. And then it's kind of this, this culmination of all those things. As if they're not great enough, what has he done? He had, when he had by himself, all right, solo acting, when he had, past tense, by himself, Purged our sins. All right? So the act of purging our sins was accomplished by Jesus Christ solely. There was no one helping him, not me, not you, not anybody else. He had, it's been accomplished. He had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. 
right hand, that's a place of honor, um, dignity, <laughs> high respect, and one who sits down is because their job has been finished. If it's left undone, you keep standing up, and that's going to be pulled out later in the letter about how the high priest under the ceremonial law never got to sit because their job was never done. All right, so all things belong to him as the heir. He made all things. He's the brightness of God's glory and the image of his person, this you know, visible manifestation of the invisible God. He upholds all things. He sustains all things. And by himself, he purged our sins, and he has sat down on the right hand on high, being made. Now, that does not mean created. That means, uh, you know, uh, obtaining by that work um, a better position. Um, he was not um, created by God. He's eternal. Um, but by that work, all those things reveal how much higher he is than angels. He, and being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. All right, so you've got the inheritance. That's what he's appointed to obtain. And that name that he has is so high. All right, so he's so far outranks angels. And that's what most of this chapter is going to be about is distinguishing the uh, honor and glory of an angel, which exists, but in comparison to Christ, everything about it is inferior and subservient. And the big picture for Hebrews is it's a call to stand fast, right? Um, if, let's take an example of uh, someone who's in uh, uh, the Mormon faith. Right? If you were in that faith today and you were to walk away from that, there would be a massive shift in everybody that you interacted with and the things that you could do and who would speak to you. And um, it would just be, it would be a massive change in life. Well, take that into, you know, Jews at this time, to follow Christ was a massive cost. You were no longer welcome, accepted, persecuted. You, you know, your life could be forfeit. You could be thrown in jail. And so there is a real temptation to say, eh, maybe we'll just go back, right? Go back to the old way. It's safer. Um, and so this whole letter is going to be an argument about why Jesus is better and why you need to stand fast for it, basically. Um, and so this is going to set up in chapter one that even if you'd heard something, you know, from an angel saying something different, and that's explicitly talked about in the Galatian letter um, when Paul's writing to the Galatians and, you know, if I come back and teach you a different gospel, let me be thrown out. Let me be cursed. Let me be anathema. If an angel appears unto you and teaches you anything different, let it go. And there are several modern day religions that their premise is that an angel appeared to so and so and taught them some additional information, and that changes things. Right? And all this chapter is going to blow that up on its head and say, no, no, no. You know, that 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 Christ, um, he is the preeminent one. He's the one who's spoken. Uh, this truth, and he's the one that we need to uh, hold to and stand fast to. So you've got these these uh, verses that say God speaking by his son, and this is the son's role, qualifications, inheritance, all this great grandeur and glory that comes with him, far outranking angels. And then he's going to go lawyer on you and say, and here's where it says so in the scripture. Here and here and here and here and here and here and here. And so if you've read through Hebrews, um, you may not have found all these uh, before, but it's it's a very useful uh, exercise to go through and see just, whoa, what's he, what's he referencing in support of his position? And so, all right, so let's click over. Come on, scroll. I'm going to turn off my annotations now. Hi. All right, being made so much better than angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name. Four, all right, reason number one. 
For unto which of the angels said he at any time, either of these two statements. So this is framed as a question, right? So like most teaching, um, you can present information by posing it as a question. You know? Did he ever say either of these expressions to an angel? And the answer is no, absolutely not. So what's the first expression? Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. What's the Hebrew writer quoting there? He's quoting from Psalm 2. Go over to Psalm 2. Do, do, do. Verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Okay, so we know here from Hebrews that this is God the Father speaking to Jesus. Right? Speaking of Jesus, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And so that lets you go back to Psalm 2 and then read it knowing that the real subject matter there is Christ. Um, I know that allusions to Christ are found throughout Scripture, um, but it's really helpful to have the New Testament say, here's one right here. <laughs> you're, you're not going to go wrong if you take that interpretation. And so Psalm 2, just you know, briefly, why did, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. You know what the Hebrew word for anointed uh, is? Messiah, or in Greek, Christ. All right, so they take counsel against the Lord, you know, not L-O-R-D, it's Jehovah, you know, the, the, the Father, against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Um, so you've got the, the, the heathen, the, the, the world, um, those in power, we say, we don't want God to be over us. We're going to be independent. We're going to break away the bands and cords. Um, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. People will sometimes joke about God having a sense of humor. Um, this says he does. But this is scary sense of humor. To laugh, he will have them in derision. It's um, you are a weak, weak thing that's attempting to overthrow the sovereign God of the universe. Um, yeah, it ain't going to work. It's more of a, a, a chuckle of, you wait and see. Um, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Not pleased. Um, bring down the hammer. Here's what he's speaking. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So the Lord is installing his king. You know, David's line was promised that it would reign forever and ever, that someone from his lineage would have a throne that endured forever. That was fulfilled in Jesus. He came and he was of the lineage of, of David, naturally. Um, but God put his king. He's the one who's going to be there. And he identifies saying, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And that begotten, you look that up in Strong's and it can uh, be translated to reveal the lineage. He is, didn't, didn't create him as the son. He was already the son. He was already the word. He's also already the trinity. Um, but he has revealed this one is my son. And so going back to our question, under which angel at any time did he say, this is my son? Never. Right? There is no angel that the father has said, this is my son. Right. Um, ask of me and I shall give the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Right. What's he the heir of all things? I mean, what's, what's the heir of all things, even the heathen? Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Um, so the son, all things belong to him. Righteous, wicked, all. He's going to be you know, the, the judge. Um, be wise, therefore, O kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. You know, call to uh, repentance. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. That doesn't mean, like, go kiss him on the cheek. That has the idea of, like, fawning and giving homage, you know, kissing the ring of the sovereign, that kind of thing. Um, when the three wise men came to find the young child uh, after his birth, you know, they came, you know, we're looking for the king to worship him. If you look up that word worship in Greek, it has the idea of a dog licking its master's hand. Right? You're acknowledging his authority. 
um, kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled a little, little less for all they that put their trust in him. And so that gives you a, you know, a real better context for Psalm 2, knowing who it's talking about you know, explicitly. Because, I mean, you could read that and think it's just talking about David. You know, it's the king that God set up. Um, but here, you know, explicitly that this is talking about the son. So the key for all this for here for the argument in Hebrews is that there's no angel who's had, you know, God say, this is my son. Right. And not only does it do it once, it's done it more than once. And so if you go over um, again, it says, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Well, you find that language, if you're doing a word search, trying to find that language appearing in the Old Testament, it appears in 2 Samuel chapter 7. I will be his father and he shall be my son. Okay, what's the context here? Context here is Solomon, David's son, Solomon. Um, David was not permitted to build a temple, right? Um, he was a man of war, bloody man, um, but God told him that your son Solomon will build for me. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He shall be my son. Um, all right. And so you hear, you see that Solomon is a type for Christ. Right? He can't, he can't do it perfectly. But Solomon, as that 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 wise king, that king of peace, the king who builds a house for the Lord. And the Lord promises that I'll be his father and he'll be my son. I'll establish his throne forever. That's fulfilled perfectly in Jesus. Jesus builds the perfect house, right? That house of his family in which we are living stones. Um, his throne is established forever. You know, Solomon's son, he's going to lose half the kingdom very, you know, next go. More than half the kingdom. Um, but Jesus, his kingdom endures forever. I'll be his father. He'll be my son. And he shall be my son. And so you've got... The not only identification of him as son, you've got the explicit identification of father. Um, we're flying to you know God, God the Father, um, and so you can see that you know even in that, um, that's never been done for an angel. You won't find a verse where God says you know this angel is my son and I'm his father. It doesn't doesn't happen. So again, all of this is what's the superiority of, of Christ as far as a messenger. Um, well, first, it's his unique relationship um, with God the Father. There's nothing else that can replicate it. Um, next, all right, so when it says, and again, it's giving, you know, an additional citation, additional quotation. So we've got one, two, so verse six says, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. All right, so we know that when Jesus was born, a herald angel appeared to the shepherds, right? Gave him the good news. And then what happened? There was a heavenly host. All the angels are singing praises and, and worshiping the birth of, of Jesus. And so you've got, you know, the lesser worshiping the better. But here it's, it's said that he said that that would happen. Let all the angels of God worship him. So if you look, and this one's a little bit more veiled than the others, um, but just stick with me. Um let all the angels of God worship him. If you look over in Psalm 97, 7, uh, confounded be all they that serve graven images that boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all ye gods. That word gods there, it, you know, in context, it could be talking about you know, the, these false idols that even they are, you know, subject to worshiping God, but that doesn't really make sense because they don't exist. Um, but that word gods, Elohim, you know, the article the, you know, is often referred to as the God. Sometimes it's used to refer to judges and magistrates and their role as judges um, operating like God does in judging. Sometimes it's also applied to angels. And so it could be that this, and let all the angels of God worship him, is found here. It's worship him, all ye uh, angels or messengers or you know mighty, mighty ones, if that makes sense. Um, I haven't found a more explicit example of that expression uh, appearing in the Old Testament. Now, we're looking here at Greek that was translated English, and our Old Testament is Hebrew that was translated to English. And so the exact wording and syntax may have been different in the original. Um, and so 
I don't, I can't find anything any closer. But either way, we've got a third citation that um, the uh, the writer of Hebrew is saying, here's why the son's better. The father's identified him and said, claimed him. This is my son. I'm his father. And when he came into the world, all the angels are going to worship him. Right? And so you've got that role of worship. Who do you worship? You worship the one that's better than you. Right? And so he's superior. Um Verse 7, we're going to narrow down, again, using another uh, citation, but narrow down the role of an angel. What, what's, the, what's the purpose of an angel? Verse 7 says, of the angels, so talking about angels, God the Father saith in the Old Testament by the prophets, who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So that ministers is your key word. Minister is a servant. What was the role of an angel? It was to be servant okay and so that comes from psalm 104 verse 4 he maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flaming fire so you know yes they are spirits yes they have this idea of being a flaming fire what exactly that means i don't, I don't know um but what i do know is that their role is revealed as being a servant right whereas the son is the one that's served all right so you've got one who says you're a servant what does he say, say to the Son? So you've got that contrast. Unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. All right, where, where's that um, coming from? I think that's Psalm 45. Yep, 45 verses 6 and 7. Thy throne, O God. All right, who sits on a throne? A king, right? Who holds a scepter? A scepter is, you know, that stick that's a symbol of your authority. A king, and is it one that's going to you know end at your death or you know expire? No, it's thy throne is forever and ever. So here you've got angels who are servants, and yet the son is one who's entitled to a throne and a scepter, and they go on for forever. Right. So the difference in roles, which is superior, the servant or the one who sits on the throne and holds the scepter. It's pretty obvious, right? It's the son, right? The king goes on and quotes uh, the next verse thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity therefore god even thy god hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows there it is almost word for word loved righteousness hated iniquity therefore god thy god hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows all right um again christ means the anointed oil of gladness um, he had his work and he was able to do it looking forward and past it because he knew he was going to accomplish it so that he was going to sit down for joy that was before him knowing that he had fulfilled his mission and redeemed his people there's, there's a great gladness in that but the position is what's really important here that's probably the key for the argument here is that he was set above thy fellows you know whether that's above uh, men yeah, absolutely, and above angels, right? A king, a scepter, placed above. God has anointed him to be above um, fellows, right? Verse 10, another citation. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hand. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They shall all uh, wax old as doth the garment, and as a vesture shall they fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same. Thy years shall not fail. All right, so going, that appears in Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27. Okay, so here you've got uh, the attributing of creation uh, to the sun, right? In the beginning, you've laid the foundation. The heavens are the work of thy hand. Eventually, they'll perish, right? You've got this earth that's going to pass away. It's going to burn up. You're going to have something that's replaced, that's enduring. He's the heir of that, too. Um, they shall perish, but thou remainest. So he's eternal. Um as a vesture, you fold them up. So your, your garments, when you're done with them, you fold them up, you put them in the drawer. They shall be changed, but thou art the same. Thy years shall not fail. And so you've got 
Um, the attributing there, that's referring to, you know, the Son. He's using this in the argument of the preeminence of the Son. So it's not talking about God the Father. It's talking about the Son was active at the foundation of the world. Heavens are the works of thy hand. They'll perish. You're eternal. He's unchanging. All right. And then verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time? So again, another question format. Did he ever say this to an angel? And the answer is going to be no. But sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Um, and that's Psalm 110. I guess I didn't go get that one. So let's go get it. Psalm 110. Whoop. So, Psalm 10. Yeah, here it is. Verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, all right, David's the writer, the Lord, Jehovah, said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Jesus would ask the question, you know, why did David call him, you know, who, who do you think the Christ is? And they say, the son of David. And they say, if he's the son of David, why does he call him my Lord? The Lord, God the Father, Jehovah, said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So, yeah, he's the natural son of David in a sense, but he still outranks David because David's identifying him as the Lord, the master, which has been the strength. So here it is. Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies uh, thy footstool. Um, did he ever say that to an angel? No, that was reserved for the son. And so he's completed his work on the cross. What is he doing? He's sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's another name for the ancient of days, the the Father, um, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So that's what happens when all things get wrapped up, is that the enemies of the Lord are revealed to be under his footstool, that he is that one who rules with a rod of iron and that there's no one who can overthrow him. One of the last scenes in Revelation is this whole army trying to defeat God. Now, whether this is literal or figurative, I'm not sure, but the idea is that everybody tries their absolute best who's standing opposed to God, and they lose, without a doubt. And, you know, there's not a single one of the lords that are, that are you know, um, lost, but you know, there's, a, there's a total total victory. Um, so that will be when I, their enemies are made thy footstool, all right? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Did he say, sit that, sit to any angels? No. And so he asked another question. Isn't their job all to be ministering spirits? Ministering means servants. Aren't they all servants sent forth to minister, serve for those, for them, excuse me, them who shall be heirs of salvation? People will sometimes say, so-and-so's gotten their angel wings, referring to somebody dying. We die. We don't become an angel. If you are a born again child of God, you're a child of the king, you're adopted in the family, you don't take a step down to become a servant. Angels are below. <laughs> now, right now, they're, they're more powerful and mightier than we are in the carnal sense, but that's not the end result of the pecking order, right? Um, and so right now, it says their role is to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Right? In the end, they've got that salvation worked out by Jesus Christ. The role of angels is to, to minister to him. How exactly the Lord does that, I don't know. But he does, and that's the role. But compared to Christ, the King, the Son, the Son of the Father, the one who said to sit here on my right hand, does a servant get invited to sit down beside the King? No. But the Son does, the Son who's you know accomplished his work. Um, the one who's eternal, the one who's going to last uh, beyond all the days. All right, so... All this is an argument leading up to the beginning of the next chapter that says, therefore, therefore, because of all this, because this is the Son who's heir of all things, who made the worlds, who's the brightness of God's glory, the image of his person, who upholds all things, who by himself purged our sins and has sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, because he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, and then insert all the citations to prove those points. And you know, that's kind of your premise. Here's the proof. Here's the therefore. Because of that, 
we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard. Heard from who? Heard from the Son, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? All right, so Old Testament prophets, messengers, you know, spoken by angels, that whole law system, your, your, your delivery there was through the prophets and through angels. You know, if that was, if that word was sure and they are this far inferior, how much better is the truth that we've got now in the gospel of what Jesus has done and what he taught and who he is if we were to say, well, that's not really as important. Let's go back to what the angel said, right? The abandoning the new because it's uncomfortable and there's a cost. Let's go back to the old. He's saying you're choosing to ignore the better, right? He's got infinitely more qualifications, a superior messenger able to deliver um, this truth, do you think that if you were to ignore something under the Old Testament law and there's a you know, consequence for that, do you think there's not going to be a consequence if we walk away from this truth? That's what it's this great salvation. That's the gospel. This is the good news of what Christ has done. If you say, well, that's just too hard. We're going to go back to something we know and we're comfortable with. This was delivered by the Lord and then confirmed to us by them that heard him. So that's the role of the apostles, those that were there um, with him. The Lord, you know, his primary audience was the Jews, right? And he spoke in parables, and it wasn't real clear. He spoke to the apostles things, explaining things that the others didn't hear, right? And then the apostles' job was to go and expand that message out and tell it more plainly, and God, you know, would put his stamp of approval on what they're saying by bearing them witness with signs and wonders, diverse miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So how did they know who was speaking on God's behalf? He was putting signs and wonders there, stamping it. Why don't we have that today? We've got the full text. Right? God's revealed as much as he's going to reveal until Christ comes back. And you don't need those signs and wonders to testify that I'm speaking on God's behalf because the word given by the Lord and confirmed by those that heard him, has now been recorded. We use that as the test. So, you've got, I mean, that's, that's the big therefore. We ought to pay attention to what the Son said and what was confirmed, what he began to teach and what has been confirmed by, by the apostles. Um, rather than taking the easy way out to go to what was just given under the law. And the law was a type and a shadow pointing to the real of Christ. And that's what the rest of this Hebrew letter is going to be about, is pointing out of how Christ is superior in all things. Um, but just, just as his qualifications for being a worthy and trustworthy, credible source with the authority to give you news directly from God the Father, if you don't know anything else, this should be reason enough to listen and pay attention very carefully to what he said and what those um, you know who are with him um, confirmed going forward. And again, not on their own, um, but that which God is you know, testifying on their behalf. Yeah, these are speaking truth. They're, they're signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit that followed according to God's own will. So that's probably enough for today. <sighs>